Hallelujah. Before dismissing the three to six, um, we're going to pray for them and bless them as they go um, hear the word of God and spend time in his presence and pray that it is a blessed time. Let's pray.
Father, we bring to you the children, and we thank you that whenever we do that, you take them in your arms, you bless them, you kiss them, you lay your hands on them, and we know that your eyes are, your eyes are upon them every day of their life because we have committed them to you, and we trust you, God, with our children, and you trust us with your children that you have given unto us. We bless the time that they're going to have in your presence this morning, and may it be... Um, anchored in their hearts and may your name be anchored in their hearts and may they commit their lives commit their hearts to you and ask you to come and change them to come and do well in them oh god we ask this in yeshua's mighty and glorious name amen and uh we're going to uh, thank the lord that he's uh, our provider and present to him our tithes and offerings of this week but before that let me share these uh these uh, pieces of scripture, uh, Psalm 37, 25, I was young and now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. Psalm 34, 10, the lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Psalm 103, 5, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the soaring eagle. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you because you are our provider. You are help in time of need, O oh God. And we thank you. Not only we present to you our tithes of, and offerings of this week, of this month, but we thank you because you are our provider. You do not let us grow weary. You don't let us go hungry, nor our children be hungry or begging their bread. We can put our trust in you, our hope in you. We can fix our eyes upon you because we know that you never forsake us. You are our provider, ultimate provider in every, every situation of our lives, finances or clothing or food or any situation. You're the provider. You give the provision. You give and you give and you give. Father, give us the gift of giving and make us enter this dimension of the joy of giving and the joy of seeking the reward in you. And this dimension where we can see your kingdom manifested around us in our lives in the lives of our children and everything that you have given us, oh God. Would you please bless our tithes and offerings and the sacrifices of our hearts, of our mouths, but also what you have given us in terms of finances and any, any material, any material thing, oh God. We do this and we thank you in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen.
לצאת מהחושך, לצאת אל האור, על אהבתך. חסד על חסד, פאר תחת תפר, אלינו תבוא, נקום לתחייה.
upon your people Israel pour your spirit out God we want an awakening we want a revival we want to see things God that we've never seen before we do we believe that you can show us we believe that you're capable and that you're able to do it Lord but God we want to see it 
We want to see what we've been believing for. We want to see it, oh God. We want to see your spirit manifested in this place. We want to see your spirit manifested here in Herzliya, here in our congregation and in our community. We want to see it being manifested among us, God. So we will knock at your door and keep knocking. We will keep seeking you, Lord. We will keep asking you, God. We want it for this place. We want it for this place. We want it for us, God. We want it for our lives. We want it in our families, Lord God. We want your spirit for your people, Israel. We want your spirit for this place, God. Lord, I don't want to wait for you to shake me for me to believe. I don't want something traumatizing or disastrous to happen to me for me to open my eyes and see that you are God and, and God in control. I see you, Lord. I see you and I see how great you are. And I know that your spirit and your presence is so powerful there's no barrier for it there's nothing that can stop you from moving there's nothing that can hold you back lord god you're powerful and you're in control we want to see it we don't want we don't want any any barriers we put everything down before you. We lay it all down before you. And I know that when, when you come, there is no denying it. When your presence is here, there is no denying it. And we thank you for that, God. We thank you for those that are around us that maybe haven't experienced the, the salvation and, and the knowledge of who Yeshua is and received that for themselves. We, we thank you, God, that we don't have to say anything, that your spirit speaks to their hearts, that your presence is something like no other. So I pray for those right now. I pray for my family members. I pray for, for each and every one of you. If y'all have family members, y'all have friends. This Wednesday, we were praying for, we were praying for that this Wednesday uh, in our in our little small group. We were just praying for the, for the for those that are that are here, our friends and our families, and of course our families back at home, the ones that know we know Yeshua, the ones that know we are believers, um, but haven't had maybe received him for himself. We were praying for this this week. And I pray that for us. I pray that we would have his spirit, that we would be filled with his love, his grace, patience. Family needs a lot of patience, right? Our family members. But that we would really express the love of Yeshua to them in a way that really imitates him in a way that they know, okay, this is not just Daniela. This is Yeshua. He loves me. Through whatever she does for me or what she says to me, God, give us the words to say. If it's in our service, it's, it's, if it's in a hug, if it's in encouragement, if it's in, let me pray for you if you're not feeling well. I don't know if you believe or if you do believe. I don't care. I'm going to pray for you if you're not feeling well. And receive it. <laughs> but I just pray for that for us. I pray that we could be that. We could carry his spirit. That we could carry his presence. And that, and that we could be that for others. That they will see and know that this is not something made up. That it's not fake. That it's, that it's God. That it's the love of Yeshua. And he wants to heal, and he wants to save, and he wants to restore. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's sing the Shema together. <laughs> Shema Israel Adonai.
Uh, good morning. My name is Chris. I'll be reading the weekly Bible readings today from the Torah, the Prophets, and the New Testament. I'll just be reading selections, um, and I'll start with the Torah reading from Numbers 25, 10 to 13. The Lord said to Moses, Peneus, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my anger away from the Israelites. Since he was as zealous for my honor among them as I am, I did not put an end to them in my zeal. Therefore, tell me I am making my covenant of peace with him. He and his descendants will have a covenant of a lasting priesthood because he was zealous for the honor of his God and made atonement for the Israelites. Now from the Haftarah, I'm going to read from Kings 19, uh, 1 Kings 19, verses 1 to 6. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all of the, of the prophets of Baal with the sword. So Jezebel sent a message, messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. Made, um, he came to a juniper tree, sat down under, under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. An angel touched him and said to him to arise and eat. Because we believe in Yeshua as our Messiah and Savior, I'm also reading from the New Testament. Romans 11, verses 3 to 6. The Lord, they have killed your prophet and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And that, and what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not, ba uh, not bowed the knee to Baal. So true, at the present time, there's a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were if it were, grace would no longer be grace. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Please you direct your attention to the screen as we will be playing a video on announcements now. We're glad you're with us today because we are better together here at King of Kings Community Herzliya. We want to let you know about a few things, so thank you for taking the time to watch our announcements. Are you visiting us for the first time today? We're happy to meet you. If you want to get connected, the first step would be to fill out one of these connect cards at the back on the welcome table and drop it in any of the offering boxes. That way someone from our team can reach out to you personally. Our prayer meeting takes place on Saturdays at 9 a.m. before the service. They meet downstairs in the Kingdom Kids room to pray for the needs in the congregation, city, and nation, and they invite anyone with a heart for prayer to join. We are a family community, so we love having small children and infants in the service with us. It means that we're growing. If they do start to get a little fussy and they need a little break, we have a small nursery downstairs past the Kingdom Kids room, equipped with amenities and the sound feed to help you enjoy the service and care for your little ones. Are you in need of prayer for healing? Do you feel like something is blocking you spiritually? Our Freedom Ministry team would love to pray with you personally. We have time set just for that on Sundays at 7 p.m. right here in this building. Please contact Tolik or Melissa to coordinate a time. Community groups are the places where real community life starts. These are environments where anyone is welcome to study the Word of God, pray together, and develop lifelong friendships. The Herzliya City Center Group meets on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. at Tolik and Masha's house. Right now, the Herzliya Pitu Group and the Glow Women's Group are on break for the summer, and we look forward to resuming in the fall. Our King's Adventures Cruise Summer Kids Camp is almost here, August 6 to 9 in the mornings. 
Registration is now open, so if you have kids from ages 3 to 10, we urge you to register now by following the link on this flyer at the back on the welcome table. This is such an amazing week where we get to pour into our children and see them encounter God in a powerful way. You don't want to miss this, so register today. We are accepting donations for the Red Carpet Center. We are asking for donations of women's summer clothes and shoes. Summer only, not winter at this time. We are also accepting new socks, underwear, or cash donations to buy new socks and underwear for women at the Red Carpet Outreach. If you have clothing donations, please bring them on any Shabbat in July and reach out to Melissa with any questions. If you'd like to give a cash donation, feel free. Please indicate red carpet on the envelope and put it in the donation box. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our announcements this week. As always, if you want to find out more, get in touch, watch our services online, or give online, you can always visit kkch.org. At this time, we will dismiss the older children ages 7 to 12 to their classes upstairs. While they're getting up to go, we invite you to take a minute and say hi to a few people around you. We pray you have a lovely and restful Shabbat. Just a, a quick announcement that wasn't in the video. I want to bring it up. On July 22nd, later this month, we will be taking a trip up to the Jordan River uh, to do some baptisms or immersions uh, there. So we'll be planning that trip. I think we'll be having a sign-up sheet for you. There's not one right now in the back, but we will be organizing that either by our WhatsApp uh WhatsApp group. If you're not part of the Updates WhatsApp group, I urge you to become a part of that. If you are not a part of it, come see me. I don't know who else to see. But uh, thank you, Wilbur. So just want to remind you of that and keep that in mind as well. Is it the Lord? <laughs> it's the worst joke. <laughs> Well, if you could turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're going to begin a new series today. You can put that first slide up there. Our new series, the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about lessons from the wilderness. Lessons from the wilderness. Doesn't that sound fun? Not really. <laughs> lessons from the wilderness. Uh, and Actually, I really think the Holy Spirit put this together. Chris, what you read today in the, the Haftarah portion was just perfect about this, uh, this incident where Elijah had been, God used him to do this great miracle of, of bringing the fire down, from, calling fire down from heaven and then bringing rain down from heaven. And then he's drawn away, runs away into this wilderness experience himself. And he says, I want to die. <laughs> And what happens in this wilderness experience, the Lord actually ministers to him and encourages him and takes time to, to feed him and actually meet his needs. So this is just a, a, amazingly perfect. I, I think the Lord strung this together. So some of you like wilderness experiences. Some of you like camping and sleeping outside without toilets. Uh, I enjoy air conditioning in my Ikea mattress and not getting... Not getting eaten by mosquitoes or hyenas. In the desert here, there's hyenas. Have you ever been to the, the desert here and heard, ugh, it's very jackals, hyenas. So why are we learning less, what, what's with this series, Lessons from the Wilderness? Number one, because it's summer and it's hot. So nice association. I just wanted to remind you that it gets hot in the, the center of Israel. So it's a good reminder through the summer. So... Secondly, the real reason that we're learning lessons from the wilderness, in the Jewish calendar, in God's timetable, and I have a, a little timetable of that calendar there, in the Jewish calendar, we have two clusters of major holy days mandated by God. And we believe that these holidays foreshadow God's plan for history. So in the spring holidays, we have Pesach and Shavuot. Pesach and Shavuot. Pesach, we celebrate God's deliverance from Egypt, when, when the Israelites left Egypt. And it foreshadows our deliverance from sin by the death and resurrection of our Messiah, who was crucified on Pesach. And then we have 
40, uh, uh, 50 days later, we have the holiday of Shavuot. And this was uh, after Israel left Egypt, they were given the law. This is a celebration of the giving of the law on this day and the beginning of harvest. And we know that after Yeshua died in resurrection, this foreshadowed, this, this day of Shavuot, or Pentecost, we call it, where we were given the Spirit. And it was the beginning of God's harvest for, uh, God's harvest for his people. So these are our spring holidays. And then we have the fall, fall holidays of Rosh Hashanah, or Yom Turah, the, the blowing of the trumpets, uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and Sukkot, like th Thanksgiving and celebration. These are Israel, these, these foreshadow Israel's national repentance. This is when Israel, as a, a nation, searches their heart, repents before God. They seek and receive atonement, or at one this oneness with God, where nothing else is in the way, their sins are out of the way, and it ends with celebration and thanksgiving. I believe this is also a shadow of something that we're going to see. Now, right now, I know we've got thinking caps on because we're, we're doing lots of charts and thinking. Right now, in the year, we are somewhere in between these spring and fall holidays, festivals. And I like to think of it, it helps me to think of it as the wilderness time of year. Why? Because after Israel was delivered from Egypt, they went through some stuff, didn't they? They went through a wilderness experience. But between Egypt and the promised land, between the deliverance from Egypt, the coming out of the Red Sea, and then actually getting to Canaan, there was some stuff in between. Amen? How many of you, if we look at the foreshadow and what this means, how many of you have been to the cross and received forgiveness from God, but then went through some stuff afterwards? No? We're all good afterwards? We've been through some stuff afterwards. We, you, you might have had your cross experience. You might have been born again and, and had this resurrection of life from the dead. And it, it's amazing. It's deliverance. It's freedom. But then sometimes, in fact, pretty much all the time, we go through some stuff in between. If we look historically, there was the cross at Pesach. We, we had our Pesach lamb that was, was crucified and, and sacrificed. And we had the Shavuot, the giving of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. But in between that time and what we look forward to is Israel's national redemption. We believe all Israel will be saved. In between that time and this time, there's a wilderness experience. We're not there yet. In our personal lives, we're not there yet. We've gone through and we're going through some stuff in the middle in that wilderness. Now, there's one little interesting day in between this wilderness experience. Jewish people observe a day in the summer called Tishba'av. Say Tishba'av. Tishba'av. It means the ninth day of the Jewish month of Av. So the ninth day of the Jewish month of the Hebrew calendar, Av. And on this day, over the years, Horrible tragedies occurred for the Israelite and Jewish people. Now, this isn't all bad news today, so <laughs> you, we, we'll smile a little bit. But Tish B'Av, this day over the centuries and millennia, this day marked horrible things that happened, tragedies that happened in and through the, to the Jewish people. On the ninth of Av, the Israelites, back in the wilderness, were supposed to enter Canaan, but... Remember, they had this wall that blocked them, not a wall of enemies or a wall of an actual wall. They had this wall of unbelief. And they said, we cannot go into Canaan. We cannot fight these giants. We, we, don't, we don't want to go and follow this man into Canaan. And because they did not believe and obey God at that moment, God made them wander through the wilderness for 38 more years. It was a national tragedy. It was a wilderness day, the beginning of their big period of wilderness. And that happened on the 9th of Av, the Tish B'Av. On Tish B'Av, 9th of Av of uh, 423 BC, the first temple was destroyed because of Israel's sin. On 9th of Av in 70 AD, the second temple was destroyed because of Israel's sin. 
On the ninth of Av, the Bar Kokhva, who was this false messiah, led a revolt and was defeated in 133. Then the Christians had their sins. Jews ex were expelled from England in 1290 AD by the Christians on the 9th of Av. From France in 1306 on the 9th of Av. They were expelled from Spain. The, the Jews were expelled from Spain in 1492 on the 9th of Av. World War II began in 1914 on the 9th of Av. Nazis gained final approval for their final solution 1941 on the 9th of Av. Mass Deportation to the Warsaw Ghetto began in 1942. All, all these things happen all on or like the day before or the day after. Tishba'av. So this is not a happy celebration, Tishba'av, for the Jewish people. It's like celebrating happy death day instead of happy birthday. Happy divorce anniversary. These aren't, this isn't good times that we're celebrating. It's a time of mourning. But listen, it is a profound thing to look at, back at mistakes and sins committed by our forefathers in the past. And tragedies committed against your people in the past and learn from them. That's why we're learning lessons in the wilderness. In this series, the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at Lessons that we can learn from Israel's wilderness journey after they left Egypt and before they got to the promised land. This in-between period, between the deliverance and then the celebration. There's this wilderness period. And how many of you all know, if you read your Bibles, Israel always didn't do the right thing in the Bible. And how many of you all know before you start judging Israel that you always don't do the right thing? <laughs> So I want to do two things today. I want to get you in the frame of mind for what these next few weeks, these next few lessons we're going to be examining in the next four or five weeks. And I want to briefly go through our first lesson. So are you in 1 Corinthians chapter 10? I have my phone Bible today because I realized my real Bible, um, half the New Testament fell out, so I, I don't have it anymore. <laughs> So I'm going to just read 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 11. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink that we did, for they drank from the rock, spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Messiah. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, these things occurred as an example to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Messiah, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages have come. So there's a lot of lessons here. But the verse one, verse one gets you in this frame of mind. Don't be, I don't want you to be ignorant. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be ignorant. In the U.S., from where I'm from in the South, we say ignorant instead of ignorant. We don't say that. We cut words out. Ignorant. Don't be ignorant. So why, 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 did, why did Paul write this letter? So he was writing some corrections to this community, this uh, commu uh, believing community in a town called Corinth. These believers in this town called Corinth had such an amazing revelation of God's grace, of God's gifts, of God's freedom. Man, we were singing, pour your spirit out. Give us manifestations of your presence. The Corinthian community back then had these amazing manifestations of the presence of God. They had so much freedom. The spirit was being poured out. If we looked back on them today, we would say, they are that's the, the congregation I want to go to. I want to run to this place. They could feel his presence. It was amazing. They, they would say, look how spiritual we are. Look at all the supernatural gifts that we have. 
Look at how wise we are and all the teachings we listen to. I've got, my, I've got my podcasts with every, every preacher that I like to hear, and I'm listening to them 24-7. I love to hear the Word of God. So look how much I can speak in tongues, they would say. No, I can do it louder. No, I can do it. And so they're all speaking in tongues over each other and screaming in tongues, and, and, and they're so spiritual. And some of the people started to think, well, I'm so spiritual. I'm so gifted. I'm so loved. I'm part of God's special people. It doesn't matter what we do. Oh. He loves us no matter what. Isn't that true? He'll, he loves you no matter what. So it doesn't really matter what we do. He's poured his spirit out. He gives us gifts without repentance. Don't worry about the rules, man. Free your mind. I don't know why I sound like a hippie today. <laughs> Listen, God loves everybody. Doesn't he? John 3, 16, 17. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world that, that he should condemn the world, but that through him the whole earth would be saved. God loves everybody. He absolutely, sacrificially, immeasurably loves you. You cannot even scratch the surface of what that love is. God loves everybody, but God is not always pleased by everyone's lives all the time. I always love my boy. Believe me. I love my daughter. She hasn't done anything wrong yet because she's a baby. <laughs> and she never will. No. I, I love my son. I love my boy. Am I always pleased by everything that he does? Not really. Are you pleased by everything that your children do? Yeah. You have a <laughs> So Paul wrote this letter to people that needed some reminders of this. Don't be ignorant. Yes, we have his grace. We have his gifts. We have his spirit. We have his favor. But remember the wilderness. Remember Israel's hi history. They had his grace too. They had his spirit too. They had his favor too. They were his special people. They were delivered. They were loved. They had his presence. Physical presence. You could see it. You could, it was tangible. There are people who have experienced the grace of God and the presence of God and who have even been used by God who have now fallen by the wayside in the time of testing, in the time of their own wilderness. These are warnings. Be careful. This could happen to you. Just, yes, you have the grace of God, but watch out. Paul tells us in verse 6, these things occurred back then to the Israelites as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil as they did. As warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has, uh, the ages has come. A wise person learns from their own mistakes. A wiser person learns from the mistakes of others. <laughs> but I just want to chop, chop my own leg off and see if it feels good or not. I want to make mistakes and see, if, see how it feels for myself. I want to learn from my own mistakes. That's, don't be ignorant. Don't be ignorant. Sorry, you didn't come to be insulted today. So in the next five weeks, we're going to be learning lessons mostly that are warnings from Israel's wilderness mistakes. But in our first lesson today, I, I want to take time briefly to correct a misconception about what wilderness is, about the nature of of God himself and about the nature of wilderness itself. When God brings you to a wilderness, when God brought the people of Israel to a wilderness, his goal is not to punish you. Some people think that if I'm going through a, a season where it's, it's not so good, God must be punishing me. I must have done something wrong. When God brings you to a wilderness and he will bring you to a wilderness, his goal is not to punish you. The end goal of a wilderness is not just to make you suffer. His goal is to reveal himself. When God brought Israel to the wilderness, he wanted to show himself. He said, I want to bring you to the wilderness so you can worship, so you can be my people and I, I can be your God. And you don't need the distractions of Egypt in order to do that. You, you need to learn from me alone and be by yourself. So see, some people have this distorted view of God. 
Well, he loves you, but he's ready to slap you with punishment the first way you look at him the wrong way. It, Bible, this is all rules. It, it's, it's all warnings. It's all punishment. When we discuss warnings these next few weeks, warnings are just an expression of the love of God. I don't warn my child against the dangers of talking to people on the internet because I'm waiting to throw rules on him and punish him. I tell him not to talk to strangers on the internet. He might not understand it, but there's a really good reason, amen, that I have to tell my child, don't talk to strangers on the internet. Don't go on messenger or, or weird little things and find strangers. These are rules today that I have to set for him that he may not understand why I've set them for him right now, but they are out of love. It's out of love that I enforce rules. When God initially brings you or anyone to a wilderness, it's not for punishment, especially the Israelites in the wilderness. People think, well, God was just mad at them all the time in the Old Testament. God brought them and God brings us into the wilderness experience to show him himself. And you know what? Himself is good. God is good. When, when God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, was it because they did something good or was it because the Israelites did something bad? Did I hear neither? Neither. It was out of his own goodness and kindness and a promise he made to great grandpa Abraham that he delivered them. It was not by their merit. He showed grace to them. And that's the first thing he wanted to teach them was his kindness, his love, his goodness, his grace. When you have a new baby, you spend the first years of their life showing them love, affection, tenderness. You take care of them. Before there's any rules that are set down or warnings that are set down, you're teaching them that, number one, you are their mother or you are their father that loves them. That they can trust you and that you will take care of them in the best way that you can aren't you? There will be warnings. Yeah, eventually, two, three years old, you'll give them little rules and little warnings, things like that. But the foundation of those is goodness. The first lesson we teach our kids, the first lesson God taught the Israelites, and the foundation of what God wants to teach us is revealing his goodness, the love of God, his intense kindness. We must learn from his goodness, what he's like, how we approach him. Yeshua said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, pastor said it last week, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you discipline, a well, whooping. Is that what he says? No, no, he will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am going to teach you a lesson, buddy. No, learn from me because I'm gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we look at lessons from Israel wandering around in the wilderness, our first lesson is that God is good. I want you to say that. God is good. God is good. That first, even, I think it was two years in the wilderness. No one got sick. No one died. Everyone Eight had their bellies full. God just spent two years revealing his goodness to the people. I think it was one year. Sorry, David's going to correct me later. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10.1. Our ancestors were under the cloud and they passed through the sea. That's a lesson. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. That's a lesson. They all gained the same, uh, ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual root, uh, rock that accompanied them, and that rock was the Messiah. Before all of Israel's mistakes, they had this time in the wilderness learning what their God was like. When God rescued Israel from Egypt, the first thing he showed was his nature, his love and action, how good he really is. Think about it. When Israel came out, of Egypt, they saw 10 amazing miracles where God plagued their oppressors and spared them. Then when these people were led out into the wilderness, not just by an old man, by a stick, they saw what leading them. There was this pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire, this enormous pillar of fire that was leading them. 
that by itself, we're like, oh my gosh, I've never seen a pillar of fire or a pillar of cloud. That's amazing. Then when they came to the sea, they were cornered by Pharaoh's army. The sea splits, and they walk over on dry land. Every one of those people that left Egypt through that sea was no longer a slave. You may have been a brick maker in Egypt. You, you, you may have been a housekeeper for one of Pharaoh's nobles. You, you may have been a gardener. You may have been a musician in the temple of Ra. It does not matter what your status was in Egypt. When you come out through that sea, when you are baptized in that sea and come through on the other side, you are no longer a piece of Egyptian property. That's not you anymore. You become his. That's our lesson from the wilderness. If you believe on Yeshua, if you've been what we call baptized or immersed in him, that means you left the slave under the water and you come up a child of God. If you were an Israelite that came up out of Egypt, you are surrounded by God. A pillar of cloud on one side and a pillar of fire by night. His presence surrounds you. It leads you. It guides you. He shepherds you. You are not lost. You are not abandoned. You are not forsaken. He is with you. You are his and he is yours. He's in your midst. That's our lesson from the wilderness. We're not only surrounded by his presence, we as believers, we are filled. He comes and dwells inside of us as we were singing. Fill us. God is trying to teach us who he is and who we are in relationship to him. Then God taught the Israelites about provision. Not only is he deliverer, not only is, is he God with us, he is provider. They're in the wilderness. Their Pesach matzah starts to run out. And they begin to raise a concern to Moses. If only I had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you brought us out to the desert to starve us and this entire assembly to death. Dude, you see the cloud right there that's been guiding you. you just, did you see 10 minutes ago how you crossed from the sea and you sang for 20 minutes about his goodness? And now you're, you, you don't think he can provide for you? That night quail landed on the camp. And the next morning, wafers, ma uh, manna appears on the ground six days a week for the next 40 years. God is a provider. Water runs out. We brought some canteens from Egypt, but they're gone now. Give us water. Eh, oh, give us water. Oh, fine. Moses strikes this rock and out comes water gushing and flowing for years. Some say in, in the, what we read in 1 Corinthians, believe that the, actually that, that rock that he struck rolled along with them in the wilderness. Can you imagine that? Just rolling along. If they had to go somewhere, the, the flow of water would stop for a second, and then it would just by itself just start rolling down the sand with you. And then when we stop somewhere, okay, the rock stops, and, and the, the elders of Israel would come around this rock and say, Spring up, a well! And the well would just start gushing water again, and, and we drink and are thirsty. Isn't that amazing? I, I don't know how you could ever doubt God's provision when you see that year after year, day after day. There's a lesson that God wants to teach us from our wilderness, that he's a provider. He will provide all our needs according to his riches and glory in the Messiah, Yeshua. Not only will he provide these needs, he provides himself as provision for our sins day after day. Like that rock, he follows us. The Holy Spirit is very patient with us and comes with us. How many of you have sinned since you are, were a believer? Raise your hands. Don't be proud of it, but raise your hands. <laughs> Did the Holy Spirit fly away from you? Did you have to go? To, I mean, you have to ask forgiveness, of course. You have to come and repent. The Holy Spirit doesn't fly away from you. He was grieved by your sin because you've defiled his temple, the place where he chose to dwell he chose to take up residence in you, but he's been patient with you. He molds you. He woos you back to himself. Just like that rock followed Israel, whether they were being good little boys and girls or bad little boys and girls, the rock followed them. The Holy Spirit is very patient with us. In the wilderness, Israel was attacked by an enemy, the Amalekites. Israel was not an army. They were not used to fighting. They were slaves. They were used to making bricks and gardening and playing maybe instruments in the temple of Ra. They were not used to fighting. And their battle strategy was, 
is a good idea. Let's have an old man stand on the top of a mountain with a stick and do this. That's their battle strategy. Yet they win the battle. God fights your battles. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. He fights for you. That's a lesson from the wilderness that we're learning by being out with God, out of that comfort zone, out of the pots of meat in Egypt. It's only in the wilderness do we discover that God is fighting for us. He is good. It was even in the wilderness after Israel had sinned by worshiping a golden calf that Moses cried out, show me your glory. Glory was this manifestation of his, the ultimate manifestation of his presence. And God answered to him when he said, show me your glory. God answered to him, okay, I will show you my glory. I will cause my goodness to pass before you. You cannot see my face, but I will cause my goodness to pass before you and I will declare my name. His goodness is the representation of his glory. And Hebrews says that Yeshua himself, think of how good Yeshua is, is the exact representation of the glory of God. His goodness, he has chosen to represent his glory. He passed before Moses and revealed himself. And he said, Exodus says, as he passed in front of Moses, he proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord is compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands of forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. But what was first in that? Yes, God can get upset. Yes, sin is sin, and we need to be warned about it. But what's this first thing? How does God choose to introduce himself? The Lord, the Lord, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger. This is the foundation he sets. So we close. I want you to look at your life. Are you going through a wilderness experience? Are you going through a wilderness experience in your own life or maybe in your own family? Maybe you feel stuck, like the people of Israel felt stuck wandering. Maybe you feel lost. Anyone ever feel lost? Like Abraham, when he was called out of Canaan, he didn't know which way he was, he was supposed to go, had no idea. Maybe circumstances in your life are horrible, like Job, where his family, half his family died. His wife told him to curse God and die. He felt abandoned by God. Maybe you feel hated or betrayed like David when we talked about last week at community group where, where he was running from Saul. He was anointed to be king, and yet now he's out here in the wilderness running away from what seems to be his calling, just trying to spare his own life. Maybe you feel overlooked like Joseph who had a dream and a promise from God, yet 18 years, something like that, that he saw nothing. He was a slave and a prisoner. Maybe you've took a wrong turn in your life. Jonah. We all know that Jonah took a wrong turn. He disobeyed God. Found himself in the belly of Sheol, in the belly of a whale. Maybe you find yourself fearful or alone like Elijah, like Chris read today. Or maybe you just are going through a period of being tempted or tested severe temptation or testing. Yeshua himself, he says after he was baptized, after he went through the water, the Holy Spirit led him to the wilderness, not through the wilderness, to the wilderness, to be tested. If you're going through a wilderness experience, maybe the enemy is involved, maybe there's some disobedience in your life that causes you to be there longer than you need to be there, but maybe God has allowed you or even led you into a wilderness experience. Maybe he's even led you to that place. Why? Everyone that has ever been used by God has gone through a wilderness experience. He leads us there for a reason. Why does he do that? This is the place where he reveals himself. He will reveal himself to you in this wilderness. This is the place where he can speak to you. Why? Because you need him to speak to you in that time. You know the, what the word wilderness or desert is in Hebrew? Anyone know it? Midbar. Midbar. Do you know what the word 
speak is in Hebrew. Midaber. If you know anything about Hebrew roots, the vowels, we throw them out. <laughs> and we look at that root. Mem, bet, dalet, resh. These are, it comes from the same root. This is the place where God speaks to you. This is the place, Hosea 2, 4 says, when he's talking about Israel, who's forsaken God and forsaken the law, he says, therefore, I'm going to now allure her, bring her in. I'm going to lead her to the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. The wilderness is where we discover, rediscover love. It's the place where he tests us. Everything from the inside comes out. It's the place where he teaches us. It's a place, wilderness is the place where he shapes us and makes us strong. There's some ways that God can only shape us when we are brought through discomfort and brought through a wilderness. Can you stand with me? The next few weeks, we're going to be learning some lessons, some more lessons from Israel's sins in the wilderness and what we can avoid and, and steps that we can avoid. But listen, we can never avoid the wilderness forever. It is not a bad thing. God wants to bring you there to teach you about himself. Exodus chapter 15, uh, 16, it's not in my notes. And it's not on the, uh, the screen. But there's a portion of scripture after the, uh, Israel had whined about not having food and complained and said, we should just go back to Egypt. The Lord spoke to them and says, in the morning... You shall see the glory of God, for you hear his, for he hears your complaints. But what are we so that you complain against us? Uh, so, sorry, Moses said that to them. So he promises that in the morning uh, you will see the glory of God. Now it came to pass, as Aaron spoke, the whole congregation of Israel, that they looked towards the wilderness. They turned to look towards the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. God wants to show his glory. God wants to fill you with his spirit as we are praying, and as we we're all just agreeing with. And I just sensed during worship time this, this real hunger in this room to be filled even more and more with the spirit and be expanded in the spirit, with the spirit of God. But very often that happens in the wilderness. It's in the wilderness. It says he will send springs to flow through that wilderness. That spring is the Holy Spirit. God will use these experiences in your life to make you go after him and to reveal himself to you. Father, reveal yourself to us. Reveal yourself to us. If anyone in this place is going through what they sense to be a wilderness experience right now. And we went through a few, maybe the signs that you were going through that. I just want to pray for you right now. I don't want to pray that you'll just get out of that as soon as possible. I want to pray that God will use this to bring you through, to show you what he needs to show you about himself, to shape you and mold you into the person, into the image of the Messiah. If you feel like, we, it's amazing. Pastor Daniel prayed a very, some, something very similar last week. If you feel like you are going through a wilderness experience, you're going through a dry season, I just want you to raise your hand and I want to pray for you. You feel like you're going through a wilderness experience, just raise your hand and I'm going to pray for you. Father, you see the different hands that are raised, Lord. Bless them with your presence. Open their ears so that they can hear you speaking. Open their hearts so that they can sense you drawing, you, drawing them near to yourself. Reveal yourself to them. Let them be like the children of Israel that was complaining maybe and, and, and having a hard time and, and arguing with Moses and maybe arguing with God even. But 
When they turned to look towards the wilderness, they saw your glory there. Lord, I pray that everyone with their hand raised and all of us as a congregation, if we go through a wilderness season, that we will make the decision to turn our heads, turn our gaze, turn our direction to the glory of God. That we will not stay focused on our own, oh, poor me, pity me. This wilderness season stinks. But we will turn our head towards him towards you. Reveal yourself to us in a new way. Lord, I, I admit that I sense that I'm going through a bit of a wilderness experience myself. Some of it's just circumstance. Some of it's basically having a new baby and barely getting sleep. <laughs> Lord, as we were praying earlier, fill us up. Give us a fresh wind. Give us a fresh revelation of yourself is revealed to us in the Messiah. In the name of Yeshua. We thank you, Lord, for this time in the wilderness. Let us not take it for, for granted. Let us not take it lightly, but let us cherish it as, our, as a honeymoon phase even, as a gift that we get to know God more. Reveal yourself to us. We pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. Let me bless you before you go. Lord, bless you. Lord, keep you. The Lord, make his face shine upon you. Lord, be gracious to you. And Lord, give you peace. Amen. Encourage you a few things as we, uh, you're free to stay, of course. Please stick around for some coffee. I didn't get to see all of you. and Give you all a hug. Uh, red carpet donations, as we said in the announcements. If you have any donations to bring, summer clothes for women or new socks and underwear for women, is that correct? Then please bring them. Melissa, could you just raise your hand, wave? This is Melissa. She is our representative from the Red Carpet Center. She uh, is our liaison and helps take those things over there. It's a beautiful ministry that ministers to, uh, what's the way, best way to say it? So mostly drug addicts and prostitutes, women from the streets in uh, inner city Tel Aviv. So we have partnered with them for a few years. Uh, and so we are continuing to do that. And we just want to be able to bless these girls, show them that they are daughters of the most high God, that they are loved, that they are cherished, that they have not gone They've not snuck into this earth, sneaked into this earth. They're not here by accident, but they are seen and they are cared for. And we want to give them that dignity back. And then we want to give them that cherishing back. So please, if you have anything uh, to bring, we ask you to bring that here on a Shabbat. And we can take care of that for you and take care of them for you. So God bless you all. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your Shabbat and a great week next week.